Dear Lord, we thank you for your word that you've given to us so that we can understand better who you are. Uh, we pray that you help us and guide us to walk in your light so that your Holy Spirit reveals to us uh, what your word has to say. Lord, we, we pray for understanding and that we can understand both with our heads and with our hearts and that we can apply what we learn to our Christian life and our Christian walk. Yes, God, yes, Lord. So we, we pray a thank you for the fellowship that we can enjoy with one another. We pray, yes, we pray these things for in your glory. Amen. 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 Okay, sorry. <laughs> okay. All right, so tonight we're going to be talking about confession of sin, and that's from 1 John 1, 8 through 10. <clears throat> Last week, we saw that God is light, and by light, that means perfect holiness. There is nothing bad in him. Everything about him in his circle is um, only perfect holiness. So if we are in fellowship with him, but we are not walking in his light, we're lying about our fellowship. So we need to be walking in his light. And that means as we come into his light, he will reveal the sinfulness in us. Um, and when that is revealed to us, we need to do something about it. We need to uh, come back into fellowship with him and walk in the light. So if we are walking in his light, we do have fellowship with God, and the sins which can break our fellowship are covered by Jesus' work on the cross. So we need to always be walking in the light of God's word, in the doctrines that he's given to us through his holy word. So tonight we have some more uh, practical verses about how we walk in his light. Uh, so I'll read these for us. It says, if we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So let's start with verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. This is a false claim that John is presenting. It's possible that someone in the church was making this claim saying that they have no sin. So John's response to that is, if you think this, you're lying to yourself. Uh, and that's the first statement he makes is the lie is first, um, that you are deceiving yourself, that you are not recognizing reality. Um, so the truth is not in us. Um, the truth is the truth which God has revealed to us. <clears throat> so that revelation that men have, are sinners uh, should be present throughout scripture, and we find that it is. In Proverbs chapter 20, verse 9, we hear that who can say, I have cleansed my heart, I am pure from my sin. This means that uh, rhetorically, no man can say that their heart is clean or that they're pure from their sin, um, by any action that they have done. It says here, I have cleansed my heart. Who can say this? Um, the implied answer is no one can say this because only Jesus Christ can cleanse us from our sins. As well in Romans 3, uh, verses 23, it says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So this verse covers all men from all time, all men and women, that every person on earth has sinned. 
Um, so to say that we have no sin is, uh, is to lie about our position. This man, Robert Yarborough, uh, said about this verse, anyone claiming not to have sin is in effect saying no thanks to the father's offer of forgiveness of sin through the death of his son. Perfection and an absence of deficiency are found in God alone. So only God is perfect and every man has sin in him. That's the effect towards everyone. But deficiency and imperfection exist in every man. To claim to be exempt from sin or sinning is to be self-deceived. So we have to recognize that uh, we are sinful creatures and that God, remember, is only light. There is no darkness in him. So this sin that is being spoken of in verse 8 is about that light and the darkness that all men are affected by the darkness. But God has absolutely no darkness in him. Okay, verse 9 says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, at this point, it's important to remember that John is writing to Christians, not to non-Christians. Um, how we receive our salvation from Jesus Christ is through faith alone in him. Confession of our sins is not a requirement for salvation, but confession of sins is a requirement for being in a close and strong relationship with God, uh, to have a good uh, fellowship with God. We need to be willing to confess our sins to him. And it says that if we confess these sins to him, he is faithful uh, that means um, that he will not put us aside. He will remain steadfast with us. Uh, he's going to be faithful to us, just like we should be faithful to him. We should follow his example of faithfulness. But also he is righteous. That means uh, he is legally correct in forgiving our sins. If we confess them, he has the right to, uh, to forgive those sins. All right, we have a question. What about those uh, who do not confess their sins directly to God? What will happen to them? So uh, we are asked to confess our sins, and the context here is to God. We are not told to confess our sins to, uh, to a pastor to a priest, um, our sins and uh, our consciousness of our sin, that's revealed to us by God. Um, God uses the Holy Spirit to convict us of our sins. And when we are convicted of those sins, we have to act on that conviction and confess them to God. Um, so uh, it's, it's been said that sin should be confessed. Uh, in the same realm that it is revealed. So if God is revealing that personally to you and other people are unaware of this sin, then your responsibility is to confess it only to God. Uh, in order to remain in good fellowship with your brothers and sisters in Christ, perhaps if a sin that you've done has affected them, maybe a lie that you've told someone else, this is first an offense against God. So you have to confess this sin to God, and that brings you back into fellowship with God. But your lie, for example, would also put you out of fellowship with your brothers and sisters. So in order to maintain a good relationship with your brothers and sisters who have been affected by your sin, you should also confess that sin to them. Now, you should be most open and most quick to confess your sins to God. Because ultimately, any sin, even a sin against your brothers and sisters in Christ, are first a sin against God. So we have to be faithful always to confess our sins against God. 
And then um, I would say through prayer with God, um, ask him to reveal to your heart who else um, you should be apologizing to, um, confessing this sin to. Um, many sins in our lives will be sins that we only confess to God because we sin on a daily basis. Um, it's just part of the Christian experience. It's part of the experience living in this fallen world uh, that we will experience sins and we will actively um, fall into sins. And um, when the Holy Spirit reveals it to our hearts, we have to act and we have to act quickly on that to, um, to push away the revelation of the Holy Spirit is to choose to walk in the darkness uh, rather than the revealing light of God. Um, so when he reveals that to our hearts, we don't want to quench the spirit because the more times we tell the spirit, no, I'm not going to confess to that sin or no, I'm not going to uh, act on the revelation that God has given to me in my heart, uh, the harder it's going to be to communicate with the spirit in that way. Uh, so we need to be faithful in confessing our sins and he will be faithful and righteous. So he will be consistent and justified in forgiving those sins. And it says in forgiving us our sins, forgiving us the sins, that means the sins that we confess to him, he's going to forgive um, consistently and um, justifiably. But he's also going to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So that means even the sins that we don't know, that we don't understand, even those sins um, that aren't revealed to us or that uh, we don't become aware of, even those sins uh, we will be cleansed from. Uh, that could be, for example, sins not, of, not that we commit, not sins that we actively do, uh, but even sins that we uh, passive or not passively, sins of omission. That means things that we should be doing, but we don't do. We might not be aware that we should be doing something that we should be. And those sins, if we're not aware of them, we can't confess them. So God here is promising that if we're faithful in confessing the sins that we do recognize, he will be faithful in cleansing us from all of our unrighteousness. And remember that the more sensitive you are in confessing your sins, the easier it's going to be for God to convict you of your sins when you're conscious of that. When you're fully walking in his light, your sins will stand out. They will be so apparent to you that you'll uh, want to confess them immediately to God. Uh, so this is going to be our required condition number two. Remember, our first required condition was walking in the light. And this is our second required condition is confessing our sins. And this is the first way that we can do that uh, because sin is the separation between us and God. Uh, when there is sin existing in that relationship, there can't be fellowship. So if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just, he'll forgive those sins and cleanse us from our unrighteousness. And in Proverbs 28, 13, King Solomon has told us, he who conceals his transgression will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will find compassion. So King Solomon is saying that if we hide our sins, if we conceal them and don't reveal them, we won't prosper. And um, I think this prosperity is talking about the uh, prosperity that we have in fellowship with God. Uh, but if we are confessing them, that means telling God that we recognize these sins and also forsaking them, um, resting in God so that we abandon these sins, that we don't continue to walk in these sins. Um, his revealing light should push us away from doing these sins. If we're confessing the same sin to him every day, uh, this never makes us question our salvation, but we have to continue to reestablish fellowship every day. 
it's much better for us to continue to walk in our fellowship, uh, being quick to confess our sins, but also doing our very best not to fall into patterns of sin. Also, the psalmist writes in uh, Psalm 32, I acknowledged my sin to you, you being God, and my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you, God, forgave the guilt of my sin. So David here is recognizing that he first acknowledged his sin to God, and God forgave him of the guilt of that sin. Um, so it no longer would weigh on David's heart, separating him consciously from fellowship with God. Also, Paul to the Ephesians uh, says that in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us. Now, this verse is speaking about our first tense salvation when he first saved us and we have eternal salvation, that we have already been redeemed with his blood. He has already forgiven us all of our trespasses. So when Jesus Christ's blood washed us from all of our sins, it wasn't only our past sins and our present sins, but also our future sins. Those are all forgiven already. Um, so when we ask him for forgiveness, we're not asking him for judicial forgiveness. We're asking him for family forgiveness because now we are in the family of God. Uh, someone told a story once to help me understand this, that uh, imagine that there is a judge and one day his son um, comes before him in the courtroom committed of a crime and this judge forgives his crime and pays the penalty for his crime he pays uh, the debt or the fine but then he goes home and he punishes his son uh, in the family not by the law so he pays the debt to the um, to the state he pays the debt of the law which Christ did for us on the cross. But then he takes care of the problem of that, um, the problems which that caused in their relationship at home. And that's what God is doing here when we confess our sins. He is not paying the penalty for our sinfulness as Christ did on the cross. What he's doing is he's forgiving us as a father forgives his son. So Zane Hodges has to say about verse 9, Christians ought to be ready at all times to acknowledge any failure which God's light may expose to them. Each Christian is responsible to acknowledge whatever uh, oh, the light here makes him aware of. And when he does so, a complete and perfect cleansing is granted him. So if we remember Jesus Christ in the upper room told his disciples that they are already clean, but he has to wash their feet. So when we confess our sins, Jesus Christ is faithful to wash our feet, to make us not dirty in the world. Um, we've already been cleaned, uh, but now he is washing us. Tom Constable says about this verse, if we confess our sins, God will then forgive the sins we confess and will additionally cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Consequently, we do not need to worry that he has failed to forgive us for sins of which we are unaware. Sin incurs a debt to God, but forgiveness cancels the debt and dismisses the charge. Sin also pollutes the sinner, but God's cleansing removes the stain so we can be holy again. Remember, God's light is God's holiness. God absolutely promises forgiveness 
that is consistent with his justice because Jesus Christ paid the penalty for our sins. And he finishes by saying, the fact that God has removed the penalty for our sins at conversion, that's our initial salvation, does not remove the necessity for confessing our sins. Again, the issue is not acceptance by God, but fellowship with God. So conversion, forgiveness, makes us acceptable as members of God's family, but continual forgiveness enables us to experience intimate fellowship as sons within God's family. All right, our last verse for this morning is 1 John 1.10, that if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. This is our last false claim for chapter one. So this is false claim number three. And again, this is possibly a claim that someone in John's church has been saying. So he wants to correct their thinking. Because if we say we are not, or that we have not sinned, that means we have never experienced sin, then we are going to make God a liar. And God's word is not in us. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 20, we read that indeed there is not a righteous man on earth who continually does good and who never sins. So this verse alone, if they know this verse and understand this verse, that it is true, that it is God's word, uh, then uh, to say anything different is to claim that God is a liar. Uh, so in Romans 3, 3 through 4, uh, Paul recognizes that uh, God must always remain truthful and faithful. So he says, what then? If some did not believe, their unbelief will not nullify the faithfulness of God, will it? May it never be. Rather, let God be found true though every man be found a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. So uh, this accusation that God has spoken something false, that God is a liar, is a very problematic thought process. We do not want to fall into the temptation of saying, I am right and God is wrong by saying that I have never sinned. God uh, is wrong when he is saying that I have sinned. John 8, four, uh, verse 44 says this about lying. He says, you are of your father, the devil. This is Jesus speaking to one of his disciples. And you... No, speaking to the Pharisees, you are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning. We remember Cain and Abel and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Where whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature for he is a liar and the father of lies. So if Satan is the father of lies and we are accusing God of being a liar, then uh, we're in big trouble. We, we are lying to ourselves. We are lying to God. We are lying to others about God's nature. We are not walking in the light. So verse 10 is really a summary statement of verses five through nine, but it's also the climax of the most problematic thing that we can say. Uh, because here we are aligning God with the nature and characteristics of Satan. Um, and that is a very problematic thing. So we need to be um, always conscious and understanding that we as humans 
are sinful. We cannot make a claim against that. We cannot say about any human that we are not sinful, that we have never sinned, uh, because that would make God a liar, and God cannot be a liar. That is the realm of the devil. Uh, if you remember back in Matthew chapter 12, the Pharisees accused Jesus Christ of working by the power of the devil. The result of that accusation was the removal of the offer of the gospel of the kingdom to Israel. Because of that accusation, Israel in the first century was cut off from their kingdom promises, that they would not receive them in the first century, but those promises would be offered to a later generation. So the, the accusation that Jesus Christ was working by the power of the devil was the climax, was the ultimate offense against God. Uh, so we, we do not want to be guilty of this accusation. In 1 John 1, 6 through 7, we read last week that if we say we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So uh, today in verse 8, um, we learned that we have to, uh, so let me get to it. One second, let's read this last. Uh, so Tom Constable says about verse 10, the false claim here is that we have done is not really sin. This is the third and most serious charge. It puts God's revelation of sin aside and makes man the authority for what is and what is not sin. So remember, this goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, when God, uh, when Adam and Eve eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and God says, now they have become like us, knowing good and evil. But what he's talking about there is that now they are deciding for themselves what is right and what is wrong, uh, when that is God's position. Um, God gives us the lines of what is right and what is wrong. Remember, God said, the fruit of this tree is not good for food. You should not eat this. But when Adam believe or when Eve believes the lies of the serpent, she says, it says that she saw the fruit that it was good for food. Um, so at that point, she decided that she can judge what is right and what is wrong rather than God. So Tom continues, this claim says God is wrong in his judgment of man and is therefore a liar. The claimant dismisses his word as invalid. So we do not want to claim that God's word is invalid. What then is the principle of fellowship with God? Succinctly stated, it is openness to God and full integrity in the light of his word. So we want to remain constantly open with God. We want to keep the line of communication open, and that will include confessing our sins to God. And we want to walk in the full integrity of his light, which is his word. So as the word reveals to us what is sin, we have to be conscious of how it is revealing that to our hearts so we can confess the sins that we become aware of. Uh, so that's the same slide. All right. So in confession of sin, uh, we learned from verse 8 that our sinfulness is self-delusion. Uh, when we deny our sin, yes, we are lying to God. We are lying to other people. But we are also lying about reality to ourselves. We are uh, not acting with the full revelation of what is true and what is real. Also, we are denying God's revelation of our sins. This puts us out of fellowship with him. Uh, what he convicts us of, of sin, 
if we ignore it, it doesn't go away. Uh, that conviction remains. Uh, but we need to be conscious of it. We need to be sensitive to it so that we can remain in fellowship with him. We ought to confess the sins which we are aware of, and God will cleanse us from all unrighteousness, including the sins which we are unaware. Finally, to claim that our sinful actions are not sinful is tantamount to calling God a liar. His words have not changed us if we do this. All right, so those are our verses for tonight. And let's see. Okay, so are there any uh, are there any questions? For me, no. No. Uh, it's a different uh, topic. It's not about fellowship. It's about dispensation, mm -hmm. about when uh, the innocence. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think I don't know if it's right to say about that because this is not about the fellowship. Uh, about That's fine. Uh, when That's Eve, when when Eve said that. Uh, decide as what you said earlier that knows how to decide or how to think about uh the the fruit of the tree is good for food so she is decide already so is that means that he is not in she is not innocent right uh, <laughs> i'm sorry i don't know yeah, if that makes it, sense it, it's a good question so uh, just so that everyone on the same page with what Janet is talking about. Uh, in dispensational theology, we recognize uh, in certain uh, different eras of time, God has worked through different groups of people or through people to establish a household. So he, he chooses stewards who are men to uh, reveal his word to and to be responsible to his word. So uh, the very first dispensation that we recognize is usually called innocence. And uh, innocence is probably not the best name for it because Adam and Eve weren't innocent. Rather, their, uh, their uh, spiritual nature, I guess, had not yet been tested. So some have uh, some have proposed the name of I can't remember it. Reynolds Showers called it uh, unconfirmed righteousness or something like that, where uh, they have not yet committed any sins, but they have un undergone any tests yet. So in the garden was the very first test. So they had been tested to see if they would be faithful. So he calls it that it's unconfirmed righteousness, unconfirmed justness. Uh, so it's it's kind of like a probationary, pro probational uh, dispensation where it's it's not yet curbing sin because sin hasn't come into existence yet whereas in later dispensations god will give revelation and also commandments about how to avoid that sinful nature that we have so uh janet is right when when she's uh, about eve uh, being tempted by satan no she's not innocent there uh, because innocence uh, Innocence brings into someone's mind both the idea of ignorance, right? Yeah, but also um, already having been judged, because someone is called innocent, they've been judged and found not guilty. Well, she wasn't guilty of anything, uh, but she also had not yet been judged. She was unconfirmed yet in her position, and when she had the opportunity to sin. 
she did sin. Um, but I think that brings up the very good point also that Eve was deceived. Eve was tricked in entrance. Uh, she did have the responsibility to trust God's word over the purple, which she did not do. But uh, whenever the apostles or whenever the prophets look back at the sin of Adam and Eve, they put the blame on Adam because Adam was not tricked. He chose willingly to sin. So I think that's also a good indication that uh, Adam was the primary steward of the dispensation of innocence. And he was the one who caused that dispensation. To so that's actually a very good question. So feel free to ask any questions. <laughs> I'm sorry for for different topic. No, actually, it, it does fit the topic of fellow because um, a dispensation and the stewards of a dispensation, uh, dispensation doesn't dictate how one is saved. It dictates how one interacts with God in fellowship with it. So God was um, in fellowship with Adam and Eve. We, we walked in the cool of the garden with them. Uh, that he appeared to them in the garden. So they had fellowship with him in this dispensation. They lost that fellowship when sin broke that connection between them. Because this was the first introduction of sin, there was not yet in place for mankind a bridge that could come and bring them back into fellowship. So, uh, when we get to... Uh, Chapter 3, verse 20, uh, verse 22, where God clothes with the garment of animals. Uh, he is bringing them back into fellowship with him in order to get my presence in the covering for this sin. And that's when we confess our sins to Jesus Christ. Uh, he is covering us for those sins. Uh, Satan is the is called the accuser. He stands in the courtroom of God and points at God's people and says, look at his sin, look at his sin, look at his sin. Um, he should be guilty of death. But Jesus Christ stands up as our advocate, as our lawyer. Advocate is the same word as lawyer. And he says, my, my death covers his sins, that because I died, he is also covered from that sin. So that is uh, our sin covering is Jesus Christ. He died instead of us as our replacement. So uh, I think actually, Janet, it wasn't off topic. It, it, it has to do with fellowship because the dispensations have to do with the fellowship of God's family. Uh, this dispensation of grace, it's about the church, not about the unbelievers. Our duty in fellowship with God is to preach the gospel to unbelievers, but it's also to edify one another, to grow each other up in God's word so that we understand it better. And by doing these two things, we glorify God. And those are the three duties of the church to uh, to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to the whole world, to uh, teach each other, to edify the church, and to glorify God. That's the duties of the church. And when we're faithful in doing those things, we are succeeding in our dispensation, but we know that ultimately our dispensation will also fail because it will end in the period of the tribulation. Um, so, yeah. um, unfortunately, we already know we won't be successful, but it's not even that unfortunate because if we could succeed and be, um, be able to succeed without Jesus here on earth, um, it wouldn't make much sense in our sin nature uh, because we are sinful creatures. We need a sinless um, person such as Jesus Christ. Um, 
Thank you. No problem. Are there any more uh, questions, comments on any topic we can, we can talk about? Or any prayer requests also? Those would probably be good. We could pray for each other during the week. I, I, I want a wisdom prayer. <laughs> wisdom prayer. That's a very good prayer. You know, Solomon, when, uh, when he became king, God told him to ask uh, ask for what he needed. And rather than asking for riches or for a bigger kingdom, Solomon asked for wisdom. And because he asked for wisdom, not for himself, but so that he could rightly, um, rightly walk with God and lead his people, God blessed him in many more ways, including wisdom. So I think wisdom is a very wise prayer. So yes, uh, Lisa, we will pray for you for wisdom. Uh, and for each other, we can all pray for wisdom. <laughs> We're all busy, but yeah, but when having this time of fellowship, uh, we're just also excited and, but before that we're like tired and <laughs> now we're awake. Yeah. So it gives us really a, a joy in our heart if we, if we still uh, uh, dig, digging and deeper into the words of God. So thank you for you then for uh, sharing and for teaching us. So, yeah, thank you. Uh, so yeah, next time we meet, we will look at First uh, John chapter two, verses one and two. So next time, just two verses, uh, verses one and two. Yeah. Hi, Risa. Risa is there. I just. Oh, Risa is here. <laughs> yeah. Um, maybe. She, Hi. She's Hi, Riz. You are muted. So. It's okay. Uh, all right. Well. Janet, would you like to pray in closing for us? Yeah, sure. Okay, okay so let us pray. Um, Father God, Lord, thank you so much for uh, giving us opportunity and have courage in our heart, under God, to get in, to know more about your word and to know uh, how to apply it in our lives, uh, being fellowship with you. And Father God, uh, encourage our heart, our substitute God, to to apply that uh, we need to lift up each other, to teach each other, their God, and uh, bring people in our lives to practice that, to teach them. Lord, uh, thank you so much for uh, every one of us here, uh, Lisa and Riza and uh, Nita, oh dear God, myself, and our teacher, Dane. Uh, thank you so much for each every one of us for giving this opportunity. And Lord, uh, may other people also that who heard this uh, fellowship, Bible study, oh dear God, I pray for the listeners that they can also uh, meditate and how to fellowship with you by reading your word. Lord, I pray that you bless them who are listeners this time. And Lord, uh, continue to guide us, especially this time of pandemic. And Father God, bless Dane's life, Father God, and whatever his desire, especially he is in the seminary. Lord, I pray for wisdom and understanding for him and all of us. Thank you so much, our God, and all this I pray and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.